I think 10.1 is a pretty light section, so that's good. We can sort of get back into the swing of things. Um, we are we're not done, done with integration. We'll come back to it in chapter 11. We'll use it, I think, in one chapter 10 section but we're done with our emphasis on integration. How to this too, kind of a weird class. It gets fit very, very much in half by spring break. We spend the first half talking about something. And then in the second half, we say, okay, let's talk about something totally different now. We're going to start by introducing sequences. Um, in particular, sequences of numbers. Um, so <laughs> Sorry about that. So a sequence it's the, the mathematical curse. We we never use one syllable if we can use more than one, but a sequence is nothing fancy. It's just a list of numbers. And you can have finite lists, or you can have infinite lists. But in this class, we're going to be looking at infinite sequences. So infinite lists of numbers. And I mean, it's easy to imagine this. You could have the sequence <laughs> of the even numbers, two, four, six, eight, etc. It's an infinite list, it never ends. Or you could have the sequence of the prime numbers. Again, it's an infinite list, it never ends. So the idea of having an infinite list probably isn't that foreign. Um, notice that sequences are ordered. So we can talk about the first prime number, the third prime number, and so on. So this is one way you could have a sequence to just kind of describe it in English. Um, what we're going to do, our only goal for the day is to talk about other ways that we can um, describe sequences. Let me start with defining sequences recursively. And I'm going to start with it because it's not what we're going to spend most of this class doing. Um, but this is a really important idea. And I guess even before that, we should um we should introduce a bit of notation. We ordinarily, even before that, um, when we want to talk about an arbitrary sequence. We usually write down something 
like this. We write down the first few elements of the sequence, and then we use ellipses to indicate that the sequence just goes on forever. So in this notation, you see a sub one, a sub two, a sub three. So the a's are staying the same. We're calling each element of the sequence a, but we've got these subscripts that are increasing. The next element of the sequence will be called A sub four. And to denote this compactly, we can write the following. In curl the brackets A, and then some subscript, some letter in the subscript, I, J, and N are all sort of common choices. Let's say A sub I. And the sequence starts with one, A sub one. So to the bottom right of the subscript, we put where the sequence starts. It starts with A sub one. In the upper right, we would put where it ends, but we're looking at infinite sequences. They don't end. So in the upper right goes the infinite symbol. <laughs> so there's compact notation. We're working with a sequence. This notation can be modified in the sort of natural ways, like prime numbers. If we have the sequence of prime numbers, a sub one is two, a sub two is three, five, seven, and so on. Well, one of the prime numbers is different from any of the others, and that's two. Two is even, two is the only even prime number. So maybe you want to get rid of that from the sequence. Maybe you only want to look at the odd prime numbers. Well, if we wrote erase this one and write in a two, Okay, we're now starting from the second element of the sequence. We are removing a sub one from the list. So you can do little modifications like that. In some computer programming languages, stuff gets indexed starting at zero. So sequences have a zero entry. If any of you do any programming, you might be familiar with that. But for the most part, we'll just, just be starting with a sub one, the first entry of the sequence. So with our notation down, it now makes sense to talk 
about a recursive definition of a sequence. When we define a sequence recursively, we give you two things. We gave you the first value or values in the sequence. <laughs> and then we gave you a rule. And this rule is a rule for finding the next entry in the sequence if you know all of the previous entries. So for example, we can have something like A sub one equals one. Then here's our notation, A sub N plus one equals n plus one times a sub n. This is an example of, an, of a uh, recursive definition. We have an initial value, And then we have a rule. And this rule is saying, if we know the first few entries of the sequence, if we know a sub one and a sub two and a sub three, all the way up to a sub n, then we can find the next entry of the sequence. We can find a sub n plus one using this rule. So in particular, a sub one is one. A sub two, now that's a sub one plus one. So according to this rule, here n is one. So according to this rule, we should take this number here and we should multiply it by the previous entry in the sequence. If n is one, we should multiply it by a sub one, and that's two. Let me, that was kind of scrunched. Let me cord on off a little space. A sub three. Well, what's if this if three is n plus one? I mean three is two plus one. So n is two. And n plus one is three. Yeah. And according to this rule, we should take n plus one, we should take three, and then we should multiply it by a sub n. Well, n is two, so a sub n is a sub two, Three times two is six. So what would a sub four be? I won't 
walk around and look at work because this is a pretty brief answer, but I would like you to figure this out and have someone tell me. I've heard 12. I don't know that I agree with that. Okay. Maybe we were getting ahead of ourselves. Let's work this out together. Beautiful. 24, I do agree with that. Uh, thank you. So that's, but that's, uh, let's work this out and let's give ourselves space to work. So we figured out that a sub one is one, a sub two is two, a sub three is six. And we were asking about a sub four. So four, the key to this is we have a formula for a sub n plus one. So the key to this is whatever your subscript is, you should be thinking of it as n plus one. Four is three plus one. So n equals three. And once we figure that out, we go to this formula and it looks complicated, but it's actually a plug and say. So N is three, three plus one. Times, again, N is three. So a sub n is a sub three. And we can go to this list of values we've generated and we see that we've already found a sub three. A sub three is six. Four times six is 24. Another, I mean, a classic Fibonacci sequence, what? a classic recursive sequence is the, uh, is the Fibonacci sequence. I just called it classic, which means I'm probably going to forget it, but the Fibonacci sequence is an example of a sequence that traditionally starts at zero. Um, we give a sub zero and a sub one. And then I'm only even mentioning this. I mean, I've called it classic. We're not going to use it in this class. Um, but I mention it as an example of a recursive sequence where we give, instead of giving just the first entry, like we did in the last example, we give the first two entries. And we need them both, A sub three, yeah. Again, the key to recursive sequences 
is that three, um, n plus one gives you an n. Three is two plus one, so n is two. And then it's really plug and say if n is O, um, I got careless here. I said, okay, we have the first two entries. We'll find the third. Sorry about that, because the Fibonacci sequence starts at zero. The next entry isn't A sub three. It's A sub two, n is one, so a sub one, well, n is one, a sub n minus one, n is one, one minus one is zero. So the next entry is two. And I accidentally was starting to illustrate a difficulty in these recursive definitions, which is that if you want like A sub 1000, there's no form to the you can use to find it. If you want A sub 1000, you have to patiently find a sub one, then A sub two, then A sub three, up until A sub 999, and then you can find A sub 1000. Because let's put that mistake I made back on the board. We know A sub zero, we know A sub one, we want a sub three, then n is two. So this is a sub two plus a sub one. And we look at that list of values and we don't know what a sub two is, so we can't find a sub three. We have to find a sub two, first. Recursive sequences, there's something that you won't see a lot of, at least in Shadron State, because Shadron State doesn't have a lot in the way of programming. We do have a data analytics minor, and I know that uh, Matthew Bauer over in the Business Academy is getting a coding club set up, but not a lot of access to coding at Shadron. And that's where this really shows up. It shows up in computer algorithms. You know, N equals, we have some user, in the put, and then we have like a four loop or not n. We have, I'm um, sorry about that. We have x sub zero maybe equals some user input. Then we have a four loop maybe for n is less than 1,000, x sub n plus one. Maybe this is a wow loop. My own computer programming is pretty dodgy. But we um, iterate on x, x sub n plus one equals for some sub program applied 
that x sub n. Uh, yeah, this looks good to me. And then you end the for loop. So you have some user input in value. Um, and then you, you would probably be, what am I doing? I don't care about my pseudo code. But the point is you'd have something where the user inputs a value, then this computer algorithm repeatedly does something to the value. It does something to x sub zero to get x sub one. It does something to x sub one to get x sub two. It does something to x sub two to get x sub three. And it keeps doing this a thousand times and then it. So this stuff shows up all of the time in programming. It's not really going to show up significantly in calculus. We've actually seen an example of this. I mean, I wouldn't expect anyone to have it memorized. This was long ago, way back in Calculus 1, but um, when we were doing root finding using Calculus, and we had this algorithm where, okay, we have a function, we want a root, and we introduce this algorithm. And the way the algorithm worked is that you selected a guess kind of near the root, called that x sub zero. Then you used the tangent line to find a new value, call it x sub one. Then you used x sub one to find a new value, call it x sub two. Then you use x sub two to find a new value, Call it x sub three. And these values are getting closer and closer to the root. And I said, I wasn't sure if you'd remember this. Maybe I was projecting a little. I'm not sure that I remember exactly how this algorithm goes, but. As I recall it, x sub zero would be a user inputted guess. Then x sub n plus one was x sub n minus f of x sub n divided by f prime of x sub n. And that was Newton's method. Um, so we did back in the day see an example of these um, recursive algorithms. And the significant point of this method, and this is something we'll get back to, probably it will be tomorrow, but the significant point of this method is that it produces a sequence of values. And as we go down this list, these sequences 
these values are getting closer and closer to the root of this function. So we're going to want to talk about that. We're going to want to talk the, about the idea that the values of a sequence can converge to some number. It's very similar to the limit. The idea that we had in calculus one. Um, before we do this, I said, okay, we have recursive definitions. And I said I was covering this first because it wasn't what we were going to spend the rest of the class sort of talking about the rest of the semester talking about. Um, for our purposes, we're going to mainly be looking at sequences. Well, the reality is that, let me finish this thought. Uh, spring breaks frazzled my mind. Um, in general, we're going to be looking at sequences. Where we have an explicit formula for finding these values A sub N. Like maybe A sub N equals n squared plus one divided by n. So some kind of secret form to the involving n. And the very nice thing about having a sequence defined this way is that you can find any value of the sequence you want just by plugging the value you want into the formula. So going back here, I made an error. I asked for a sub three. And we couldn't find a sub three because to find a sub three, we needed a sub two. And I hadn't found that yet. Here, that kind of thing does not happen. If we want a sub three, Well, n equals three. So this is plug and play. If n is three, then n squared is three squared. And n is three. And a sub three is 10 thirds. So we didn't need to find a sub one or a sub two in order to find a sub three. It was just a matter of plug and play with a formula. And I mentioned this, it ended up mentioning it a little out of sequence. But, I'll, and I'll pick this up tomorrow. I mean, I see we only have four minutes left. But what we're really interested in is the idea that a sequence of numbers can get closer and closer to some value. It's a kind of limiting idea, by which I mean it's an idea that's similar to the limits. So for example, 
suppose that a sub n is one divided by n. And if we look at this sequence of numbers, it looks like this. And these numbers are getting closer and closer to zero. One eighth is what closer to zero than one seventh. One ninth is closer to zero than one eighth. And so on down the line. These values are approaching zero. Like a sub one million will be one one million. That's small. Keep going. A sub b then will be one one b then. That's even smaller. Keep going. A sub one trail then will be one one trail then, and so on. So these values are approaching zero. And we'll pick up with this tomorrow, but we're going to borrow terminology from previous sections and denote this as a limit. The limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals zero. Right on the n edge of the end of class, but does anybody have questions about what we've talked about today? If not, I will end the recording and I'll see you tomorrow.